Hello and welcome to video three for week two. In this video, we're going to talk about Taylor series, a way of extending our notion of power series. So what do I mean by a Taylor series? Well, this looks exactly like the definition we had before of a power series. And this is in fact also the definition of a Taylor series. And I'll throw it up there on the left since I'm going to use it for the rest of the video. The only difference is when I talk about a Taylor series, I think about taking a function that I more or less already know and assigning a series to it. So if you've got an exponential function, you've got a, a sine or cosine function, you've got a logarithm, you've got some other function you care about, how can I express it as a power series? And we're going to call that the Taylor series of the exponential, or the Taylor series of sine, or the Taylor series of the logarithm, or any other terminology like this. You get one choice. You get to choose your center point alpha. You know, alpha should be a point in the domain, if it's not in the domain, it doesn't make sense to try and exp express it as a series centered there. But alpha can be any point in the domain of your function. You can ask, does this function have a Taylor series centered at that point in its domain? And if it does, how can I determine it? So deter to determine it, what I need to calculate is I need to calculate the coefficients. Once I know the coefficients, and I've chosen the center point, well, x is the variable, and these n's are just the indices of the sum, everything is determined. I know all the pieces. So if I choose a center point and calculate the coefficients, that gives me a Taylor series. So let's talk about calculating coefficients. We're going to work in general because I want to show you where the general formula for calculating coefficients comes from. So let's first take a function that's expressed as a Taylor series. Again, I'm going to leave this here to remind you of the general form all the way through. If I evaluate it at alpha, I get alpha minus alpha in this exponent. And that's going to be zero for every term except for the constant term. So all the higher terms are going to go away. The only term that remains is the constant. So the first coefficient, c0, is given by the value of the function at the center point. Now let me differentiate. Again, working with the general form, if I differentiate that, differentiate term by term, I get this. Uh, the derivative starts one index in because the constant term is destroyed by the derivative set to zero. And then I evaluate the derivative at the center point. Well, then I get, again, alpha minus alpha for all except for the first term. And the first term is now the term n equals 1, the constant term. So I'm going to get c1. And it's going to be multiplied by n. But here n is 1. So c1 multiplied by 1 is just c1. So the second coefficient is given by the first derivative of the function at the center point. Let's keep going. Perhaps you can see the pattern that's developing, but let's keep working with it. If I differentiate again, well, there's the derivative again, term by term. Um, I'm now at n equals two because I have another constant term from n equals one from the previous that gets destroyed. If I evaluate this at alpha, again, I have alpha minus alpha here. So I only have the constant term, which is the n equals two term here. So that's gonna be c2 times two times one is gonna be two c2. So I, I start introducing some constants here. So to calculate the coefficient c2, it's related to the second derivative at the center point, but there's this factor of 2 involved. I calculate the third derivative, differentiate term by term again, and evaluate the center point. Again, I've got x minus, or alphas minus alphas. Those go away for all higher terms. I get the constant term starting at n equals 3. So I get c3 times 3 times 2 times 1, so that's going to be 6c3. And I can keep going this way, and I will find that if I take the nth derivative of the function, evaluate the center point, I will get the nth coefficient. And this thing that I'm building up, because I've got n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, if I differentiate, I'll get an n minus 3 down. If I differentiate again, I'll get an n minus 4 down. What I'm building is, in fact, a factorial. I'm building the product of n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to 0. And if I solve this for cm, I find that the nth coefficient of the general Taylor series centered at alpha is the nth derivative of the function evaluated at alpha divided by n factorial. So I could put that into a general form that says that a function, if it has a Taylor series at a center point alpha, that Taylor series must be the sum n equals 0 to infinity, the nth derivative evaluated at the center point, divided by n factorial, multiplied by x minus alpha to the n. So that gives me a general way of calculating coefficients.
If I want to calculate coefficients, I've got to calculate higher derivatives, evaluate it at them at a center point, hopefully find a pattern, divide it by n factorial, and put it into this sum. Notice for this to work, we need the function to be infinitely differentiable. Uh, the word analytic in mathematics means has a Taylor series. So a function is called analytic if it has a Taylor series. And now we can see that, well, if it has a Taylor series, it's infinitely differentiable. But in order for it to have a Taylor series, I need to calculate all these derivatives. So a function is analytic, has a Taylor series, if and only if it's infinitely differentiable at some point alpha in its domain. Past that, you'd have to also calculate radii of convergence, and that would depend on the center point alpha. Some center points alpha might lead to infinite rays of convergence for certain functions. At some center points, you might have very small radii of convergence, depending on the behavior of your function.